Well, very good evening to you. Um, welcome uh, to the LSE if you're not normally here, and if you are normally here, welcome. Uh, my name is Tony Travers, and I'm professor in the School of Public Policy and the Department of Government. And it's my happy duty this evening just to start the evening off and then to chair it to be an opportunity for QA uh, with uh, our distinguished panel of speakers. Uh, so I'm here to welcome those speakers who uh, are Liam Byrne, Dr. Miata Farnborough, Ed Miliband, and Dr. Andy Summers. And of course, not only to you in the audience, but an online audience uh, at the Shaker's Eye Theatre and around the world. And just briefly, who the, our speakers are. Liam Byrne is the Labour MP for Birmingham Hodge Hill. Miata Farnborough is the Chief Executive of the New Economics Foundation. Ed Miliband, Shadow Leader, uh, Secretary of State for, for Climate Change and Net Zero, having previously been Leader of the Labour Party. Andy Summers is Associate Professor of Law in the Department of Law, school, Law School, I think it's called these days, at the LSE. And in the event, what we're going to have an opportunity to, is to hear from our speakers, talking about the work of the Tribune Group of Labour MPs, who've been working alongside some LSE colleagues to propose new Labour Party policy in three priority areas, which are, have been selected for tonight. Uh, these are active government, climate security, and strong communities. They're going to look at how to shape a greener economy and close socio socio and to close socioeconomic health and well-being divides in the United Kingdom. I just want to say a couple of words uh, from the. I should say also for Twitter users, the hashtag today is hashtag LSE UK economy. The event is being recorded for those of you who ask questions uh, and will hopefully be made available as a podcast uh, subject to no technical difficulties, it says rather um, ominously. Um, and there will be a chance for you to put Q&A and for those online to do so when we've heard from our speakers. Just a few words to set the scene. I mean, it's we're here at a most interesting time for UK politics. We're now, what, nearly 13 years since Labour was last in power. The Conservatives of the coalition have been in, time, in, in power through that period. And it seems to me, as far as the Labour Party is concerned, yet again, there is the question of having been out of opposition for a significant number of years, how to shape policy, and particularly against the backdrop when traditionally, um, the Conservatives, I say traditionally, have been ahead on polling, uh, looking at economic competence. But what we've seen in the last year or so, particularly during Liz Truss's short government, is that competence probably rather uh, challenged, and certainly the polls suggest that. Having said that, Liz Truss pointed to two, econo I mean, two things happened during her period as Prime Minister, I think have profound implications for any Labour government in the future as well as for a Conservative one. First, she pointed about the need for the UK to restore trend growth closer, closer to 2.5%, not 1% to 1.5%. And second, the uh, ill-fated mini-budget showed the limits on power of a UK government to, do, to go beyond what the markets will allow. Harold Wilson used to complain about this back in the 1960s, but those constraints, if anything, are even tighter uh, on a Labour government looking ahead, remembering that in the run up to 1997, the then Labour opposition promised to follow Ken Clark's um, public spending uh, figures into that election, uh, even though afterwards he said he wouldn't have done that they would do. So there are big constraints and major challenges for public policy, for public services, for the climate, and for the way people live in their neighbourhoods and the need to narrow the divide increase opportunities for people around the country. So I'll say no more than that. What's going to happen is each of our speakers uh, in the order I read them out. So Liam, then Miata, then Ed, then Andy will speak. They're all going to come here for a couple of minutes and speak from here, then go back there. We'll have a little discussion on the stage and then I'll open it up. The, I'll open the discussion up to the audience. Uh, so Liam, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Brilliant. Thank you very much. Indeed. Right. Good evening, everybody. And Tony, thank you so much indeed um, for that introduction. Thank you so much for hosting it. It's fantastic to be here uh, at the LSE. Uh, my name is Liam Byrne, and my job is merely to do the warm up act for some fantastic speakers today and to give you um, an overview of this provocation that has been published um, by the Tribune book. So I'm not going to speak for very long. I'm just going to speak for about 10 minutes, which uh, as we say in Westminster, is the average lifespan of a Tory chancellor. Um, and over the course of that time, what I'm going to try and do is just give you um, a sense of the 75 ideas uh, that we have pulled from some spectacular experts, uh, including a couple of those people on stage. Now, before I start, the Tribune Group. Who is, what is the Tribune Group? There's an old saying in British politics, that politics is show business for ugly people. Well, as you can see, that's not true anymore. This is the Tribune Group. Here we are, chaired by our magnificent helmsman, uh, Clive Efford. Stand up, take a bow. <laughs> very slowly, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> so, the Tribune Group came together in Parliament about five or six years ago, and um, just sort of between these four walls, uh, there was quite an element of self-help and therapy uh, in those particular meetings. Um, over the course of the Brexit debates, we kind of kept ourselves together. But today we are sort of 70 to 80 Labour MPs. Uh, it's probably the biggest ginger group inside the Parliamentary Labour Party. Uh, and we've got some, uh, some great members, not just Clive, but all the lovely people you can see on the screen. Uh, and some of our members have gone on to do great things. And, and one of them is somebody um, called Takir Sama. Now, What's the starting point? The starting point for our provocation is, is, is this. And actually, these figures have already got worse today. This frames the inheritance of the next Labour government, the worst uh, growth in the G7. In fact, this coming year, the IMF has said today it will be worse than Russia, <coughs> only major economy uh, not to have recovered its strength uh, from before COVID. Um, but this is the reality of life for many of you. Because, you know, what we've now got is a set of living standards which have basically collapsed. And we've got problems that we've got to contend with that we didn't have in 1997. Principally, inflation. Now, I'm old enough to remember when the great officers of state only got fixed penalty notices of £100. Uh, now we have great officers of state being handed tax penalty notices of over a million pounds. That is what, that's about 11,000% inflation in fines paid by Tory politicians. So as you can see, this problem of inflation today is pervasive. But what goes unsaid is the transformation in our economy over the last 10 to 15 years. It's what you might call the boom and doom cycle. So for most of the post-war years, the ratio between wealth of the country and GDP was about three to one. Over the last 10 to 15 years, it's shot up to eight to one. So what that means is that assets, you know, they're now much more expensive, but earnings, what you get paid, are that much smaller. So that means if you're young, like many of the people here in this room and many of the people on stage, um, that means that assets are now beyond reach. So that begins to create these great moral tragedies, if you like, that you can do all the right things, you can earn all the great grades, you can work as hard as you like, you can get a great job, but if you still can't afford to get on, a, on the housing ladder, or if you still can't <coughs> afford uh, a pension, or if you still can't afford a place to call your own and raise a family, then actually something is absolutely broken in our economy. And that is the inheritance that the next Labour government uh, will inherit. Now, what we thought, therefore, in the Tribune Group is that basically creates four big challenges. There's the political challenge. Let's not forget this. We need a swing that is bigger than 1997 in order just to get a majority of one. We've got serious economic problems. We've got a trend rate of growth that has collapsed. 
And that is going to create massive problems of distribution and redistribution in order to restore a measure of fairness uh, to our economy. Um, and we could be here all night if we talked about some of the global challenges, not least the basic business of how uh, we reconnect our relationship with Europe. Now, in this pamphlet, we have 20 fantastic authors, 75 ideas, uh, but to try and kind of bring it down to a level of simplicity to frame the political debate, we felt that the kind of dividing lines in British politics now come down to these three. On the one hand, we've got to create a different kind of growth model that seeks to go net zero, that delivers climate security, but at the same time delivers good, solid jobs for the future. That's the work that Ed Miliband has been pioneering over the last couple of years. It's something that is felt wide and far in the labor movement. There has to be not just the kind of economic model that we've got today, but a different kind of economic model. Second, rather than what we would say is a conservative philosophy of you're on your own, good luck with it, uh, that kind of economy of haves and haves nots and have yachts, we think actually you've got to have a strategy of active government to do a couple of important things, which I'll mention in a sec. And then third, instead of this divisive politics of divide and rule, let's actually have a politics of unity is strength. That is the tradition of the labor movement. And that's something that we've got to put center stage um, in our politics. So just very quickly, when you look at the essays that we've got on green growth, you get a very clear story. Lots of you will have seen the work of Mariana Mazzucati. There is a set, she's got a great essay in here, very clear sense that just creating that net zero mission is something around which you can organize uh, an economy and an economic strategy in a completely different way. But that means you've got to rethink about how you procure things, 256 billion pounds a year. How do you trade? How do you put uh, the race to net zero at the heart of your trade policy? What does it mean for investment and regional investment? What does it mean for your energy system? What does it mean for green manufacturing? These are all things that we have to think through over the next year and a half. And then crucially, how do you make sure that you've got a fiscal strategy and a corporate governance strategy reform uh, to create a more civic capitalism? These are things that we've got to get right to. Very, very big um, sets of changes. There is then a, a set of ideas in here, which is about uh, active government. And here, I suppose, there are obviously the, you know, the old arguments about skills and lifelong learning, but also this new argument that Bridget Phillipson is pioneering about how you really become quite ambitious about early years education. But the story here is about how do you build much stronger ladders to the great opportunities in life, no matter where you start? How do you build assets and make sure people have got access to assets like, you know, homes, which many people in London in particular can no longer afford? How do you reinvent secure, social security for new times in a world where the fourth industrial revolution is going to wipe out 1.1 billion of the world's 3.2 billion jobs? How do you make sure you've got good systems that train, train, retrain, as well as provide a safety net, which just isn't there? Then on power, how do you make sure that your story is not just about creating wealth and creating ladders to wealth, but how do you make sure it power as well? How do you devolve power in some of the ways that Gordon Brown has talked about? And then finally, we'll hear a bit more about this. How do you make sure that there is a tax system uh, to pay for it? And I have to say the work of Andy and Aaron on the Wealth Tax Commission is really gonna have a big, big year this year, uh, but I won't steal uh, Andy's thunder. It's a big debate that a lot of people in Westminster are paying attention to. And then finally on strong communities and safe communities, you'll see, I think quite a lot um, both in the pamphlet, but also uh, in the House of Commons this afternoon, we're having a debate about this, about actually how you do things like rebuild neighbouring uh, policing, how do you create much more local economies, how do you create an economy of attachment, as Jess Prendergast puts it, um, that actually gives people a sense of a stake in their local community and a sense of unity with their neighbours that the Tories, we would argue, appear hell-bent um, on dividing. So look, that is a very quick canter through what is a, a very big set of ideas, and I suppose we did want to write this as a provocation. We want to make sure that this is a, a rich year for politics because as we go into the next election, ultimately we have to remember that politics is a battle of ideas and we're determined to win it. There's an old story um, that, uh, in politics that um, people like to tell fairy stories and not all fairy stories begin with the words once upon a time. Many fairy stories these days begin with when I'm elected. And what we need to make sure we do is not prom promise fairy stories. We need to offer a politics and a change that people can believe in. And that change will be an awful lot stronger if we get the engagement of great people like you 
in some of the arguments that we set out today. Thanks so much. Yes. Good evening. I'm really, really looking forward to the conversation today. I wanted to focus in on the green sprint that we need to make um, and set out the ways I think uh, we can potentially achieve it. And for me, this is the starting point of it all because I think there is now real urgency uh, because the science is absolutely clear on this. We've now got less than a decade to take urgent action to mitigate the worst impacts of climate change. And if we don't act, if we don't look to stem and stop environmental breakdown, the more chaos we're gonna see in the system, more devastating hurricanes, record droughts, extreme floods, the coastline disappearing, food scarcity, driving climate related poverty on a scale that we cannot imagine. So when the debate is often framed as, can we afford to act? Can we afford to take climate action? For me, the answer is really simple because the cost, not just in pounds, but in human suffering will be absolutely immense. And it will outweigh any investment that we decide to make proactively upfront in order to enable us to respond to the climate challenge. So I think it's a really simple choice that we have. Take deliberate action now and achieve the change that we need, or we sleepwalk into a crisis and we throw money at the problem in a panic when it will be too late. So our view at the New Economics Foundation is in order to deliver this, in order to deliver the step change in climate action that we need to achieve, a Green New Deal is central to achieving that. And the idea is simple. It was an idea coined uh, in the foundation back after the financial crisis. And it argues that we need an unprecedented mobilization of resources, unprecedented in peacetime, uh, that would essentially decarbonize the economy at pace while creating hundreds of thousands of jobs and lifting up living standards. And at its heart, the argument here is a recognition that climate change and the wider threat to our environment is a symptom of the same economic problems of an economy that is broken. So the same economic system that's failing millions of people is the same economic system that's driving climate breakdown. And so if we want to tackle climate change, we must transform the economy and we should do this in a way that works for the majority of people. So that environmental justice works hand in glove with social justice. And our view is that actually the fact that we're hitting a climate tipping point and the science to get on this is pretty clear. And the fact that we've seen this unprecedented squeeze in living standards for the last 15 years creates the foundation for us, not just to think big in this space, but also to act big in this space. But to be transformative, to rise to the scale of the challenge, I don't think we can underestimate the scale of the challenge and the sort of disruption that we need to see across the peaks. We've got to get three core cool things right. The first is that we have to commit to large scale public investment. There is no path to net zero without public investment. Again, the question is whether you do this in a deliberate, proactive way up front or you do this in a panic down the line. We cannot, we cannot make the shift to net zero on the cheap. And this is an argument that we've been prosecuting for the last 30 years and certainly over the last 10 years. And it strikes us that when everyone from the IMF, the UN, the OECD are all saying to governments that are recovering from periods of stagnation, the pandemic, and now the recession, invest, stimulate in your economy, then why not gear this towards green? So that we're responding to the crisis that we're facing today in a way that begins to deal with the more structural, bigger crisis we have in the climate emergency. You know, Germany recently announced an economic stimulus worth 
a reported 130 billion euros, containing 30 billion euros in green job creation. By contrast, our government announced 8 billion of investment targeted at green jobs through its green industrial strategy. Wholly, wholly inadequate to the scale of the challenge. And so, you know, we're pretty encouraged by where the Labour Party have landed and its, invest, its commitment to this 28 billion climate pledge. And I think for us, if this investment seeks to leverage additional investment by aligning the mandates, for example, of state-owned institutions, so the UK Infrastructure Bank, uh, the British Business Bank, to the Green Mission, alongside a package of incentives and regulation, that becomes a catalyst to unlocking the scale of investment that we need. I, you know, in the same way that we say, look, we target 2% of GDP on defense, you know, my view is that we should be looking for a similar target, arguably a bigger target, in order to drive the green transition that needs to happen. But fiscal policy has to work hand in glove with monetary policy. Um, so that the Bank of England plays that critical role in guiding finance in support of clean investment and away from dirty investment, as well as directing new finances being created into green investments. And our view is that actually if we can get the scale and the quantum investment, both by the private sector and by the public sector, we begin to create the basis by which we can invest in industries, we can create good jobs, and we can begin to start remaking the very nature of the economy. The second thing that we have to get right is alongside large scale investment, there has to be equally ambitious action at the local level. You know, we can't, we can't transition to net zero in a way that is just. And for me, that is the key point. We can do this, but the social impacts of it are potentially huge. So to do it in a way that is just, we cannot do it without empowering and equipping those at the local level to respond. If we simply push investment at the top, which is what the centralized state in the UK tends to do, we may hit our decarbonization targets, but we are likely to protect and support the very communities that will be at the forefront of the climate transition. So, you know, for me, why not say, if we've got a climate investment pledge, 40% of that gets pushed down, gets devolved into regional and local authorities in order to respond. And in return, we ask local leaders to deliver against regional carbon budgets, to develop green industrial strategies that aim to create the jobs, that aim to drive wages, and that aim to make the transition in their place. This would not only allow local areas to make the sprint to decarbonization, but it would allow them to do this in a way that potentially levels up and lifts up their communities. The third piece for us is that in return, to consenting, because it has to be public consent behind this, to the scale of change that we need, there has to be a good deal for the public. And that means, yes, creating better jobs uh, and giving people the security of knowing that they can earn a decent wage. But a key to this is not just about the creation of work jobs, but ensuring that people in sectors that will decline, that will be impacted, can transition into these jobs. And we're really interested in some of the policy tools that have been applied in Germany that we saw during the pandemic around job protection schemes as a potential way of helping that transition. So it, you know, for businesses in sectors that are declining, it gives them the opportunity to say, we will retain our staff on a shorter working week in order to ensure that people are still engaged in the labor market. And then the state cross subsidizes non-working hours in order to allow people to train up for the jobs that are being created in the future. And so for me, that becomes a big enabler of the just transition. But it also means thinking about cooperative ways in which we can organize the new industries of the future. Um, and whether that's clean energy co-ops or energy efficiency co-ops. And, you know, I think the key point that I'd make is we are going to have to upgrade and expand our green infrastructure in order to do the transition. And, you know, whether we're talking about public transport or we're talking about clean energy, for me, these are public goods that are absolutely essential to the green transition. And so they ought to be in public hands, they ought to be in cooperative hands, and they ought to work in our interests. And so for transport, actually the big priority there is how do we expand our public transport network in order to incentivize people to get out of their cars? 
the madness that we've had over the last few years where we are cutting investment in public transport at the very moment that we need to be expanding it makes absolutely no sense. And then on green energy, again, we're encouraged by the idea of Great British Energy because we think it can incentivize and catalyze, catalyze the clean energy transition. But why not complement that with regional, municipal, community energy so that we can build the clean energy system that we need at pace? And then for me, the final piece for this to work for the public is housing. Uh, we know we've got a housing crisis. Liam's talked about that. We know that we need to build 3 million homes over the course of the next two decades in order to begin to tackle the housing crisis. So for me, there are two parts of this. There is a job around retrofitting our homes because too many of our homes are draft and leaky. We need a great homes upgrade. But on the other side, we also need to ensure that the homes that we're creating, and I would argue for social homes, are green, are low carbon. And so there's an opportunity for us to do the job of tackling the climate crisis, as well as building the low carbon homes that we need, boosting the construction se sector at the same time. And I would argue that that creates the opportunity for us not just to do the sprint to net zero, but fundamentally to do it in a way that begins to make real the right that everyone should have of a home over their heads that they can afford uh, that is decent. Often people talk about the climate crisis and this is where I'll end, and there's a lot of doom and gloom. I think there is a huge opportunity. We know that we need to do this. We know the tools that we need in order to do that. And there is an opportunity for us to think about how we approach it in a way that begins to shift the very structure of our economy, dealing with the long-term structural problems that we have, dealing with the fact that we've seen this unprecedented squeeze in living standards. It is absolutely within our grasp. This is why this conversation for me is really exciting. And the thing that I have learned in my job is actually there is a really powerful movement led by young people who are at the vanguard of demanding climate action. And we need that movement to continue growing, to be very vocal and also ambitious and apply the pressure that we need to see on our politics in order to respond. I was going to try to speak from here. Can you get me the back? Yeah. Um, can I just check Ed before? You, can, if, oh, is it possible? To, is it picked up for those oh, online oh, speaking? Oh, we don't. Have a microphone, might be. Can we bring a microphone? <laughs> oh, here we are. <laughs> uh, right. Thank you very much. Well, look, it is great to. Um, it is great to be here and it's great to be on this brilliant uh, panel and uh, I really want to thank Liam and the Tribune Group for the um, uh, incredible work that they do and, and also Clive who has led that work for, for a number of years. Uh, it's also great to be back at my alma mater, uh, the LSE. Um, believe it or not, my dad taught here um, 70 years ago, 60 years ago, long time, long time. Uh, ago, but it's very good to be here. I want to talk about, and I think I want to sort of pick up where Mieta, Mieta um, finished in her excellent speech, I want to talk about a scarce commodity, which is the commodity of hope. I think the commodity of hope is incredibly important. Not false hope, not ungrounded hope, but a sense that things can be better. And I think, I think there are really good reasons to be there are really good reasons to be fearful, but there are really good reasons to be hopeful. And I think the task of the Labour Party in the next 18 months is to show people across the country that they can believe that politics can make things better. Um, because I think in a way the I won't go on about the failures of the current government, but I think partly what it has done is just destroys people's faith that government can do anything right. And, you know, I think it's rare in politics to try and learn. Um, but some of you may know that I was leader of the Labour Party until 2015, I lost the election. Um, and I've and I sort of tried to learn since then about sort of how we talk about these issues. And I think it's really interesting, the, the climate and inequality questions. Because basically, for a long time, and I would include myself in this, the inequality question was talked about separately from the climate question, both by the people who cared most about inequality, who then would say, yeah, and I care about climate too. And I think too often also the climate movement that would talk about climate, but then would 
sort of add on inequality. And the truth is that they are, as Miata said, inextricably uh, linked. Why? Because it's the poorest people in the world and in Britain who will bear the brunt of the climate crisis, because many of the same forces that have driven the climate crisis have driven the inequality crisis. And this is the crucial point. This is the commodity of hope. The crucial point is, is that just think about the transformation we need in our country if we are to tackle the climate crisis. We've got to change the way we heat our homes. We've got to change the way we travel around. We've got to change the way we use our land. We've got to change the way industry works. Are we really saying we're going to go from a high carbon, unjust, unequal world and we'll say, yeah, we're going to change the high carbon bit, we're going to have a zero carbon, unjust, unequal world? Well, no. And that is the moment of, 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 of a chance to change things, to think about how we order our society. And, and this is in a way the insight that you know, I should have talked more about climate in 2015. I did talk about it when I was the climate change secretary, but it should have been integrated more into our offer. And I think what's so interesting is what's happening around the world. Look at Joe Biden, who many people consider probably rightly in the center of the Democratic Party. Uh, look at what's happening in Europe with the response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. These two things are inextricably linked. And Miata is absolutely right. The big insight was the Green New Deal. Harking back to what Roosevelt did in the 1930s to, and, and to say, look, the, the moment of uh, the depression it is a chance to reorder um, our society. So let me just say a few things then about what we will do if we're in government, because the commodity of hope doesn't mean anything if it's not backed up by uh, substance. We are going to be the first major country in the world, if we are in government, to commit to having all of our uh, electricity system uh, zero carbon by 2030. That's within five years uh, of a Labour government uh, being elected. Um, no other country in the, no, no other big country has committed to that. It's a big, big task. It's driven primarily by uh, renewables. Why is that the right thing to do? It's the right thing to do for climate reasons. And we want to bring other countries into this as well through a clean power alliance, because we're only 1% uh, of global emissions, but it's also the right thing to do to cut bills and to fire the jobs that we can get from the clean economy. But it isn't enough just to say we're going to have renewable power, because the question is, are you going to back up the industrial, make the industrial policy changes to give people the hope that I'm talking about good jobs? And my constituency, I've said that before in this, in this auditorium, actually, my constituency voted for Brexit by more than 70 percent. I didn't follow my advice. Uh, um, why did people in the North vote for Brexit? People say, was it immigration? Is it Europe? Of course, those are issues. It's because of people saying our economy just doesn't work for us. You know, what people said was, and you know, we need, we need, there must be something better. That promise hasn't been delivered for people. The point is, this can deliver the promise. You know, jobs throughout our country, insulating homes, making electric vehicles, rewilding our countryside. Uh, a huge number of jobs, jobs in the services industry. You know, this is the biggest, could be the biggest jobs driver uh, that we've seen for many, many, uh, well, many, many decades, actually. But if that's going to happen, we need to check, we need to have a proper industrial policy. So what we're going to do, we're going to have something we call GB Energy, which we had to mention, which is, I think, probably the first time in four decades, we've had a new publicly owned uh, entity in the UK, publicly owned energy company. Why? Because if you look around the world at the countries that have driven industrial policy success when it comes to clean energy, it's those countries with a domestic publicly owned national champion. Why do I say that? 45% of our offshore wind assets are owned by foreign governments. Foreign governments, not just foreign companies, foreign governments. I went to this wind farm, the largest onshore wind farm in England and Wales. It's owned um, it's in Wales, and it's owned by um, Vattenfall. And I said, well, well, remind me, Vattenfall is 100% owned by the Swedish state. Well, the Swedish state, so some people say, oh, well, we're not sure about public ownership. It's not running. We're very sure about public ownership, it's just foreign governments' public ownership of UK assets. But this is the myth. So we say we have GV Energy, we have a national wealth fund backing that up, investing in this. Now, now, why is this important for government to do this? Some people in this room might be wondering that. Well, partly because there is a global race now for these jobs, but also the private sector just won't do it at scale. If you want to transform your steel industry, the private sector won't do it on its own. You can either have a steel industry with government investing, or you could not have a steel industry. 
Um, similarly, when it comes to cars and, and, and right across the board. So 2030, uh, clean power, GB Energy, a national wealth fund. But I just want to go to this issue, which is so on people's mind, which is the, the energy bills crisis. But there is a blindingly obvious answer to this crisis, which is partly to drive to renewables, which are cheaper as well as cleaner. But also we have the coldest, draftiest homes in Europe. The biggest no-brainer in policy making is to insulate 19 million cold drafty homes, and that is what Labour government is going to do. We've said we'll spend six billion a year, invest six billion a year to make that happen. And by the way, Miata is absolutely right. We're also going to need people to move to heat pumps. Large numbers of people to move to heat pumps. We can't say to people, well, your boiler might cost two thousand pounds, your heat pump's going to cost seven thousand pounds. You know, we're going to have to make it worth people's while to do that. Now, so we change the way we power our country. We change the way we heat our homes. We change the way we use our land. If we're going to, for example, transform the way we heat our homes, we've got to not just say we're going to keep people in fuel poverty, but tackle and hopefully abolish fuel poverty. And so this is why I think we can be in the uh, business uh, of hope. Now, the, the, the sort of question is, is this affordable, which in a way is the title of this, the, the, the theme of this thing. And Miata is absolutely right about this. The, 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 the reckless choice, the imprudent choice, the irresponsible choice is not to make these investments. And don't take my word for it, read a very good report, it's kind of report I read late at night, the fiscal risks report written by the Office of Budget Responsibility. Because, you know, this is a government's watchdog, because they themselves say, Delaying action on climate by a decade doubles the cost. The, the, and, and Nick Stern showed this brilliantly. You know, the imprudent, the reckless choice, the wrong choice is not to take this um, uh, action. Now, there's lots more things I can um, say, but I just want to end on this point. And it's particularly a message to young people in the audience. I think it's really important to tell the truth about the scale of the climate crisis. You know, one of the other things we've said is no new fossil fuel licenses, because if we carry on extracting fossil fuels at the rate we're doing, we're, we're going to way pass through 1.5 degrees. And look, 1.5 degrees is in great peril. But the American um, author, Rebecca Solnit, has launched this website and has written a book called, uh, with the title, It's Not Too Late. I think this is really important, because of course we should have begun this 40, 50, 60 years ago for the action on climate. But we mustn't succumb to the idea that there's now nothing we can do. In fact, the people who don't want us to tackle the climate emergency are the people who want us to succumb to the idea, oh, it's just all too late to do anything. China, India, they're all doing, they're all going to carry on as they are. I mean, first of all, they're not. But secondly, it's just, it's just wrong to say it's too late to act on this. And every, as somebody was saying to me the other day, every 0.1 degrees that we stop global warming rising is hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives saved. And that should drive us forward. And it says the Labour government, that's what we're going to be trying to do. Restore Britain's climate leadership, and at the same time, be the first country in the world to properly do a Green New Deal. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to uh, speak at this event. And uh, Liam Miata and uh, Ed have <clears throat> already shared their vision for uh, a more sustainable economy under Labour. Um, but of course, now I'm going to raise the, the slightly awkward question that Labour politicians are always asked um, when setting out these kinds of vision, uh, which is, uh, how would you pay for it? Um, so. First of all, in answering this question, I should just uh, clarify that, that I don't have any um, secret insight into the tax plans that the Labour Party is uh, considering behind the scenes. 
My own research focuses on the taxation of wealth. Uh, and our, our team actually talks with politicians uh, from all parties. I mean, anyone who wants to listen, uh, really. Um, but it's fair to point out that uh, on our most recent research into reform of the non-bomb status, uh, we've had a lot more interest from the Labour Party than we have had from the current government. So um, <laughs> these are suggestions um, that I'm about to make um, as an outsider. Um, but uh, here's what I think uh, the next government's strategic priorities on, on tax ought to be. Uh, and and my, uh, with my colleague, uh, Aaron Advani, um, I set out um, some of this in the Tribune pamphlet that, um, that Liam referred to earlier. So um, number one, um, and this is, is very much on the um, public policy uh, agenda already, raising more ta um, from taxes on wealth, taxing the wealthy. Um, second of all, um, and I think not so much the focus of discussion typically, is the need for a commitment to tax reform, by which I mean reforms to the structure of the tax system, rather than this um, rhetorical debate that we see so often just about, are you gonna do tax cuts or tax hikes? So tinkering, instead of just tinkering with the rates, we need a much more deep um, seated reform to the structure um, of the tax system. So, the work that I've been doing um, with Aaron Advani and other uh, researchers, um, in part as a, as a, as a package, um, so we, we did some work under the auspices of the Wealth Tax Commission, and we've done other research using uh, UK tax data uh, into possible um, options for reforming taxes on those at the very top of the income and wealth distributions. And the thing that we, that we come up against, or the, the rhetoric that we're that we're challenging is this conventional wisdom that if you want to raise serious revenue, you've only really got these three options, raising the main rates of tax from the big three taxes. So you can see here, for those of you who are in the room uh, on the slide, um, this is where our tax revenue currently comes from. And it's dominated about two thirds of all tax revenue comes from just those three taxes, income tax, national insurance contributions, and VAT, and the way that commentators and, and I have to say politicians often um, succumb to this is to think, well, there's various tinkering that we could do with taxes on um, the wealthy and raising more money from, from those at the top. Um, but in the end, um, it's only those levers from raising the basic rate of income tax or national insurance contributions or the main rate of VAT that's really gonna move the needle when it comes to paying for um, spending priorities. And so trying to collect together all of the work that, um, that my team has been doing, we, we put together this um, tax simulator, which you can play around with um, yourselves. Um, if you go to uh, aaronadvani.com, that's my um, collaborator forward slash um, tax reform. Um, you can decide which policies you would adopt and you can see how much we think um, that each of these would raise. Um, they're all backed up by receipts, so to speak. You can, uh, for each policy, you can look to the academic research using uh, actual tax data that underpins this. There's obviously some uncertainty around some of these um, estimates, but we're very transparent about um, the, the numbers here. and um, the magnitude, um, this is the key point really, is larger than a lot of people suppose, particularly when you look at these um, reforms as a package, and it is essential to think about when, when taxing uh, those at the top about the interaction between taxes, otherwise we just get into this kind of whack-a-mole where you, you close one loophole and another one uh, pops up somewhere else. So looking at these, um, Together, you know, we should be thinking in the order of magnitude of sort of 50 billion or so on the table in terms of plausible reforms to taxes uh, on uh, taxes from wealth. Um, and that's in the context of a total tax revenue in the UK of about 730 billion. Um, so we're talking getting on for about 10% of, of total tax revenue um, from these taxes. Now that may still not be enough to plug some of the um, uh, 
holes created just simply demographically um, through change in our economy and the challenges of the future. Um, but um, it's a, it, it's, it has to be part of um, the agenda for a, a progressive government looking uh, to make spending pledges. And, and so I encourage you to take a look at the uh, tax simulator and tell us which, uh, which reforms you would uh, adopt or not. Um, but then this final point um, is about structural reform going beyond taxes on the rich. So, you know, how much can we raise from taxing the rich? Our answer is more than most people suppose, but there's going to need to be other uh, more sweeping reforms um, as well. And, and here, I think um, the key message is that it is possible through tax reform to raise revenue and improve growth. It's a very frustrating um, dialogue that we're in currently where there's this, that all of the discussion is about a trade-off between are you going to hike taxes to pay for these things but that's going to harm growth or are you going to slash taxes to get the economy going? That is, I think, completely the wrong way of thinking about um, the problem because it's that focus again on just tax rates when what we need to do is make more fundamental reforms to the structure um, of the tax system. Um, and I'll just give you two examples. There's more that, um, that, that we could discuss and questions, but um, taking taxes on housing and on, on different forms of income. So um, abolishing stamp duty and reforming council tax. This is not a new idea or one that I can claim uh, credit for. This goes way back and you will find actually um, commentators from all, all parts of the political spectrum um, occasionally at least voicing support for this. I think it's a purely political um, difficulty and maybe one more of political perception than reality that it's too hard to do anything on property taxes. Maybe that's the scarring from uh, the end of the Thatcher government and the poll tax and uh, way back then, but we still have um, a council tax based on 1991 property values. No one thinks that is a, de a defensible idea. It, I mean, to cast it over to the politicians, this is a, a communications problem to solve, I think, rather than a really deep question about what's the right thing to do. Everybody knows what the answer is, I think, here. Um, and then on taxing different forms of income. So at the moment, the amount of tax that you pay doesn't just depend on how much you receive, but which sources you receive it from. So whether it's from, uh, as mo in most people's case, earnings from employment, or whether profits from self-employment or partnerships, or dividends from running a business, or capital gains from selling an asset, where you get your income from at the moment makes far too much uh, difference to the effective tax rates um, that you pay. And uh, the solution to that is essentially quite simple in terms of aligning um, or the, the rates across different forms of income. Again, we're not the first um, team to have made this um, sort of proposal. Um, there's a slightly trickier question about what you do to, um, to retain investment incentives, but actually there's more consensus on that again than, uh, than I think um, has maybe cut through to um, political um, debate so there is actually a way to square the circle with giving in terms of giving allowances for um, investment that can be growth enhancing as well as improving the fairness of our tax system and, and the potential to raise revenue so um, the message actually for me is quite optimistic um, but it does require politicians and the next Labour government to um, grasp the nettle on, on some structural reforms. Right, okay, uh, four very clear presentations looking at different aspects of what a Labour government might do and also at how uh, it might pay for it or suggestions as how a Labour government... Uh, the first thing I'd just like to kick off this, from this position is to say what you said, Liam Miata, Ed, added up to the need for a more interventionist government, particularly on what 
in olden days would have been called industrial policy or industrial strategy. It would need the management of parts of the economy, not all of it, but parts of it, more than most politicians in all parties are generally comfortable with. That is, you, you, in a sense, these things would not happen without substantial intervention to ensure that, and we have to make the point, where um, jobs disappear as a result of change, changing policy uh, to move towards net zero or beyond there, then that's going to lose some people their jobs and new jobs can be created. Now, it seems to me that does need intervention, quite a lot of industrial intervention. And I say beyond what uh, most of two of you, you've both been in government, you know how even Labour governments slightly wary about industrial policy, you know, George Brown and you know, all sort of memory. So how's this, how's it going to work this time? It's a long, that was a long time ago. I know. <laughs> so I, if, if, if you want to rise to the scale of the ambition that Ed and Miata have set up, um, it would be mad to try and do that from Westminster and Whitehall. Just the sheer complexity of what needs to be done cannot be centrally planned. It can't be um, run from Westminster and Whitehall. You've got to devolve as much of it as, as you possibly can. And so, you know, Gordon's, uh, Gordon Brown's uh, commission that some of you will have seen about what's quite a radical plan for devolution of power resources is, is absolutely right. But, you know, the thing that we don't talk about is the scale of inequality in public spending today. So if you look at capital spending or indeed public spending, it's still overwhelmingly concentrated in, in London and the Southeast. And so we've got to think much more strategically about actually how we share the public wealth better but we've, the, the centre has got to kind of let go. And so Miata's proposal about having regional carbon budgets is a really important one because what that allows you to do is to kind of say to, you know, the West Midlands where I'm from, look, this is the, uh, this is the, the roadmap that you're on. You need to come and tell us how you're going to deliver it and what resources you need in return. But, you know, what I found running for mayor of the West Midlands is that you've got to have the freedom to build the institutions you need locally. That means regional banks. It means regional coordination of retrofitting. Um, you've got to actually begin running your industrial policy regionally because you know what, what we need in the West Midlands is different to what you need in London. And we will need a different set of institutions to what you need in London. But right now we're locked into the same system and you just can't make the kind of shift that Ed talks about without letting go. But I'll come to me after a moment. Aren't you then doing two things, having to do two things? You're having to do a whole set of institutional changes. Mm -hmm and sorting out the state and only then can you deliver so you've got a whole series of things to do before you can deliver on the policy i didn't, I didn't think so because the, the pent-up energy and frustration that there is around and about the country is enormous and you know and what we've almost got to do is is just let the damn waters flow um you know we're not short of kinetic energy around this agenda we're not short of ideas we're not short of creativity what we are short of is power and resource and so and unless you go through this quantum shift in getting the power and resource out of Westminster and Whitehall, you won't achieve the ambitions that could transform our economy in the way Miata and Ed have talked about. Okay, Miata, you also talked about the need to devolve, push power down. Now, successive government, how can I put this delicately, successive parties in opposition have often talked about devolving power, but in government, aiming off for Scotland and Wales, it's proved more difficult in England. So do you think you can sort of convince politicians, because you're a, an outsider with an, a sympathy, that this time they need to do it differently? Yeah, and, you know, I was in government um, when we had the last uh, push on devolution, and it was like pulling teeth out. Um, and I think my advice is twofold. I think you've got to do it pretty quickly. Um, and so you sort of need to start the process in the first 100 days before... Uh, the system kicks in um, and persuades ministers that it's not such a good idea. Um, but I also think the other thing that will shift things is genuine crisis. You know, I think in, in the end, the scale of things that Whitehall is trying to manage, it cannot manage. Um, and I think there's an increasing recognition of that. And 
you know, there is the job of rewiring the economy, there's the job of getting us out of recession, and then there's the job of the climate transition, and it cannot be done from the centre. And so I think that's the thing that's driving the change. Um, and so, you know, when I hear Labour's plans, uh, you know, I, I'm more encouraged than I've been in the last sort of 15 years being around the debate on devolution, partly because I think it's driven by necessity. Um, it's too complex, it's too big, it's too difficult. Um, I think there was a job around building our capacity at regional and local level. Um, but as Liam says, I think there is huge appetite for it. Um, so if we create the incentives, if you push the power, if you push resources, I think places will step up. And in truth, they have a better understanding of what's needed in a patch to manage this transition. You know, the decarbonisation piece is hard, but pretty straightforward. But how you get it to work for your communities is a really tough bit, and it can only be done on the ground. Okay, very good. Well, I've had you, um, again, called for hope. Um, <laughs> and I'm you to read it. Right? <laughs> yeah. That's not a good sign. Oh, right? sure. That's not a good sign. <laughs> but more seriously, um, you know, things change in democracies, partly because of optimism and hope, but partly because of an immediate threat, and you'll and you'll talk. You're, 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 you're mm. saying balance these two things because there is a threat, but you also need hope. Otherwise, people just walk away and feel nothing can be done about everything. So, with that in mind, can I just press you a little bit on the question of, given we heard uh, from Andy about <laughs> possibility of raising taxes, a Labour government would have to raise taxes pretty soon to start to pay for all of this, wouldn't it? Well. Look, tax policy is I will get vaporized if I start talking too long about <laughs> tax policy. But but um, let me just say this about the but I think it's really important to underline this about the investment we're talking about, this 28 billion a year, the mm. Green Prosperity Plan. I mean, just to say this is significantly bigger than the recent Inflation Reduction Act per capita that, that that's been passed in the United States, which is about 300 billion over uh, 10 years, uh, 300 billion dollars. Um, I mean, this is the equivalent of you know 28 billion a year, so it'd be equivalent of 280 billion pounds over, over 10 years. Um, now we've said it's right to borrow to fund investment in the green economy. Now, why have we said that? Precisely for the cost reasons that Miata set out and I tried to set out. In other words, delay is going to cost us money. So inaction costs us money. You're locking in high carbon choices, and also. And this has become so apparent in the last few months since the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act. You know, there is a there is a massive global race on now for these jobs, mm. and you know, you know, gigafactories collapsing. You know, all of that that we've seen in the last British vault that we've seen in the last couple of weeks. You know, so it absolutely makes economic sense to to do this now. Just on the tap, I mean, I, I can without being vaporized, I can sort of just maybe say something broad about what Andy's saying. You know, I think there's some important points from what he's saying. Tax fairness is a commitment of ours. That's why we've announced what we've done on non-DOMs, on VAT, on uh, uh, private schools. I think, secondly, Andy is right to say, you know, it's not all about income, that the debate on tax has all, all been about income. Um, uh, I mean, that's why something like non-DOMs is, is clearly, you know, is about income, but it's, it's a very particular class of people. I think the third thing I would say is, you know, we are mindful, and I think this is implicit in Andy's presentation, that we are in a cost of living crisis, you know, where ordinary people are incredibly squeezed. And I think that is, you know, that is obviously going to influence the decisions that we make. Okay. And Andy, on the, given what you've heard, I mean, how far do you think, um, because you, a number of policies there would, I mean, if they were to raise 57 billion, or even just half of that, that's quite a substantial increase to a tax burden, which is already relatively high by long-term standards. And some of what you're say, suggesting would be very visible to the people who are ex paying extra. I say this as somebody who's advocated reforming council tax and its predecessor for many years to zero effect. Now, against that backdrop, seize the moment, Tony. Seize I know, you know keep going, <laughs> never give up. But more seriously, do you think that politicians, Labour politicians coming in office would be willing to grasp the nettle to begin to make some of the changes you're suggesting, because you're surrounded by two of them at least. Do you think they'd be brave enough to do that? 
given how visible some of these impacts would be on individuals? Well, just, <clears throat> just to take your, your first point about the um, historical trend, I mean, this is one that comes up a lot about um, the UK mm -hmm. being at a kind of high water mark of um, by tax to GDP. Yeah. But yes, by its own standards, not the international comparison tells a tells a different story. But even on on the history, I mean, we are, we are just in in a world demographically where uh, we have fewer people working relative to those who need support, and that implies that. Um, the share of taxes is going to have to go up. I'm not sure in that context that that harking back to a different demographic era, if you like, is is instructive um, in the end. Um, so I do think that probably net, I mean, I can say this uh, separate from the Labour Party, I do think uh, that in all taxes will have to increase. But but that doesn't mean that we're we're facing this trade-off with growth because where you get the tax revenue from matters more in the end than, than how much tax um, you're raising. You can raise through inefficient taxes or you can restructure the tax system and raise more revenue in a more efficient, more um, growth enhancing way. And, and actually our tax system currently structurally is such a mess that it's actually, it's a good thing in the sense that there's enough low hanging fruit there. I think that, that more revenue can be raised without um, uh, facing that kind of trade-off that, that that we hear about so much. Okay, enough from me. Uh, I'd like uh, one at the front for start. So we'll take one right at the front here in blue, and then in green. We'll do it by colour, then grey, and I'll come over here. Blue, green, grey. Like if you want to say who you are, good if you were. I'll come to the back. I promise. Keep it short. Get as many people as possible. I know there are going to be lots of questions. So say who you are if you'd like to. Sure. Um, oh, actually, sorry, oh. frontier. Kirsten Sambra from the International Inequalities Institute. Thank you so much for some very stimulating presentations. I'll start with one question about HMRC and treasury stru um, tax structures. I know that every treasury in the world would like to have the simplest tax structure possible. However, in your debate and in the discussion of the structure of taxes, there's one issue that I'm missing, which is the fact that you're talking a lot about incentives, carrots, but not so much about sticks. And we are not doing a particularly efficient job of, gener of taxing the various negative externalities that our economies generate, be those in the environmental area, um, emissions, etc., but also in the social sphere. So for example, why is it cheaper to hire somebody on a short-term basis than it is on a long-term long stable contract? What about the health consequences of certain jobs, et cetera? So we're, we're generating a lot of external costs um, that we're not considering in, in um, our tax reform debate. And I know that's complex um, and nobody likes to have 50 different types of uh, taxes on one issue, but it, I think it's something we need to consider. Okay, and I'm going to take the three together and then come back. And don't feel, oh, oh, panel, you have to answer all of them. Just going to answer as many questions as we can. So, yes, in green, do back. You bring the mic. Oh, and then I'll take the, the break. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Sophia, and I come from Macedonia. So my question is regarding the, the third goal around building strong communities. So my question is, how do you do that when everything is set up to segregate? So the type of passport will determine what happens in your life, the type of income will set you up and open certain doors and close others. So my question is, how do we move away from the Hunger Games survival lifestyle to a unity and a good living and not just surviving? Okay, excellent, and do back. Hi, um, my name's George. I work in online safety policy, so this is a bit different for me. Um, my question sounds a bit antagonistic, but I mean, it, I, it comes from a place of good intent. Um, <laughs> Ian spoke about fighting the politics of divide and rule with um, building community. And I agree with that, but I don't really see Labour doing it. I see Labour kind of limiting the critique of the hostile environment to qualms with poor administration. Um, and I see Labour kind of publicly turning their back on picket lines. Um, and that's coming at a time when trade unions are more popular than ever. Um, you've got people like Mick Lynch speaking to the material problems that people are struggling with. So my point is, I think that I'm quite uncomfortable with the idea of people in Westminster and 
LSE, I suppose, talking about bringing working people along with them for the green transition, whilst seemingly abandoning the political movement, which is telling Westminster and big business um, that we refuse to be poor anymore. So my question is, isn't the current um, kind of resurgence of trade unionism actually a political opportunity that Labour should be seizing upon rather than turning their backs on? Okay, three very clear. Very clear questions. Um, who'd like to go first? Well, um, I think the politicians should deal with the five, that third question, but what about the other two? Life chances, you know, Hunger Games, and HMRC, that sounds like one for you, I think. <laughs> and then perhaps on I'm guessing then the politicians can deal with the third. Can we all to give for that one? Yeah, I think the, the, yeah, I think the HMRC question was a question about um, taxes on on negative externalities. So things we, we want less of. Um, yes, we we should have more taxes on carbon. Uh, I think the the objection that people make or the concern that people have that that this will hit poorer households more uh, involves a mistake about what we should be trying to do when designing individual taxes. So what matters is that the tax system as a whole is fair, not that every individual tax does everything. So the fact that a carbon tax is regressive in isolation is not a problem so long as you're, make, you're compensating in other parts um, of the tax system. So I think um, we should have more taxes on negative externalities. It does have implications for redistribution through other parts of Can the I taxes. Sort of just press you on that because uh, in the matter of the ultra low emission zone, which Sadiq Khan is going to extend to the whole of Greater London, whole of London, I think, press back a bit, even if people, if the whole of the rest of the tax system worked perfectly, why do I imagine people wouldn't want to pay the extra bit on the tax that on the ultra because of the ultra low emission zone and that other politicians would campaign as they will do precisely against it you see the point i'm making so even if the rest of the system was fair in your terms people would still oppose the um extra impact which might be regressive i might add at the margin of needing to scrap your car or pay the charge well the the challenge is adjusting your other taxes so that the people who are left worse off are not those um, who are poorer, but those who are choosing to drive their cars relatively more, you know, at their income level. Uh, that's obviously pretty difficult to do when you have local policies like a congestion charge and all of our taxes that do redistribution are set at a national level. So that that regional national interplay is is hard. Um, but I think the, the principle is is clear. OK, very good. I mean, I say your, your think tank exists to deal with the sort of segregation from the start issue. So yeah, that, I'll, I'll just sort of um, pick up on the tax point before coming to the segregation yeah. point. So I mean, we've we've looked at this. And so I agree with you, there's huge scope uh, to think about how we uh, tax and tax carbon. Um, we did some work around the frequent flyer levy, a really, really clever bit of uh, work that the team did. And what was really interesting, so we just took one thing, um, and the reality is, you know, actually people who tend to travel more and emit more emissions tend to be wealthier um, households, and yet we don't really tax that. And you can design it in a way. So our objective was how do you protect those at the bottom? Uh, so you build pro um, you know, a progressive system into the way you do it and then design it so that you're disincentivizing people from traveling um, and essentially capturing um, some of the kind of the cost to society from doing that. So it can be done. Um, it's complicated. Um, it's difficult because you have to introduce a new tax and no one likes that. But I think increasingly we need to do that. And the thing that's always struck me is we don't really use our tax or incentive system to nudge good behavior in the market um, in a really bizarre way. You know, we don't say you're doing a good thing for society or the economy, therefore maybe we'll tax you a bit less. And if you're not doing a good thing, maybe we'll tax you a bit more. Um, and I definitely think as we try and make that transition being smart, and yes, it does create complexity, but it also creates incentives that we desperately need to sort of drive um, the behavioral change that we need to see. And then on the segregation point, I think it's a really good point. And for me, 
it comes back to the fact that the way that we designed the transition has to bring people in. So we've done work in lots of communities on just transition. And our starting point is the people who will be at the forefront of this transition should be part of the conversation about what that transition looks like in a place. And that's about you know, bringing workers, bringing people from different parts of the community with leaders, with businesses to both design a plan for their area so that there is that buy-in and then work through what that looks like. I think if you try to do it top down and by top down can exist at a regional level and you don't involve people, you miss the opportunity to bring people around. Because again, I think at the end of this is a really positive potential story we could be telling about the kinds of places people want, the kinds of communities, the kinds of society that can start sowing some of you know, the division that we've seen. Um, so I think there's the opportunity there, there's a practice there. And you know, the point on trade unions, which I'm not gonna touch, uh, but I think they are a really key part um, of that conversation on the ground. And certainly we've done a lot of engagement with trade unions that brought in other workers to start thinking about what, what does this pathway look like? And how do we design it in a way that you are protected and you have voice and agency about what this transition looks like? Very good. Yeah. Segue into trade unions. You can answer the other questions, of course, but why not? Well, I, I should start by saying, actually, anybody um, who would like us to email you a copy of the book, um, I think there are some clipboards going around. Um, just let us have the best contact details um, for you and we'll send that through to you. Um, but actually, where I wanted to start um, was with a, with a brilliant essay in here by Jess Prendergast, um, which is um, about attachment economics. And it, it, it really resonated with me because, you know, I serve the community of Hodge Hill. It's the most income deprived constituency um, in England, um, lots of low cost housing. And so it's a place where new communities come and have come quite quickly over the last 18 years. When I think about how we build unity in the community, I can see now already how the transition to a different kind of economy is a huge opportunity for us. So over the last 15 years, I would say, we've used an approach called community wealth building to bring people together around particular assets. You know, it could be, you know, old youth clubs that have been, you know, uh, become derelict and we're trying to bring them back into life. We have to bring these groups together, get people together, get neighbors together, find money to do it. But now we're asking ourselves, right, how do we do this in a way that helps East Birmingham go net zero? So we have the biggest retrofitting pilot in the country in my constituency, 27 million pounds on the Bromford and Furs estate. We're having to now think really radically about how we do the design for that by bringing the residents of what is a very, very diverse estate together and creating a much thicker associational life. But I suppose the other thing that has really struck me is the way that we work with young people to do this in new ways. So Friday we launched uh, this, this may be a spectacular disaster, but so we look, we launched Generation Earthshot for Hodge Hill. So we brought together 300 children from local primary schools. We're running, you know, our equivalent of Prince William's Earthshot Prize for these schools and these kids. But we're using that to then connect into our faith institutions, again, just to create spaces and discussions, which we use to glue people together. And so I suppose my experience is that there is a certain amount of Kind of national politics that, and, and the postures that you've got to take but ultimately the way unity in the community is built is, is bottom up and at the grassroots not top down and that is a hell of a lot easier if you've got an environment in which power and resource is much more freely available at a local level rather than hoarded uh, in Westminster. Fighting divide. I get to I get to ask the best question. Yes. Uh, um, uh, so I'd say one thing on Sophia's question. It was Sophia, yeah? uh, Question. I mean, Britain is still a far too. I know your your question was broad, but it's far too is a class ridden society where opportunity is hoarded for too few. I mean, absolutely right. Um, you know, I involved in my own constituency in a, uh, a charity which is now a national charity called Zero Gravity, and what Zero Gravity does is it works with young people who are trying to get into some of the top universities to try and give them the training in a state school that private school kids would take for for granted um, and they're a remarkable sort of success story i encourage you all to become zero gravity volunteers uh because they're an amazing charity but i mean you're completely right um john major promised who was prime minister 30 years ago promised a classless society I and mean, we are you know 
we are a chasm away from a class society. George, on your question, look, you have to make your judgment at the election about where you think Labour stands. Let me just tell you where I think we stand. I, along with all my colleagues, voted uh, against the government's anti-strike legislation. Uh, was it yesterday? Yeah, yesterday. Um, uh, yesterday. Um, uh, we said we would get rid of that legislation if we were uh, elected. It's sort of definitely the right thing to do. The trade unions are absolutely instrumental to our policy making. We said we'll have the biggest, uh, well, the, the biggest, for a generation, the biggest new rights for working people. Uh, in, including day one working rights for all for all employees. Um, uh, that is a sort of pledge we made to our so-called New Deal for um, working people. We've said that there needs to be fair pay for the people who are taking industrial action. We've certainly not in any way condemned those people. We totally understand why they're taking industrial action. What we've not said is we're going to go on picket lines. Why? Because in a year or 18 months time, we may well be in government and we will be having to be the people who are negotiating. I mean, we want to be in government and we'll be the people who will be having to negotiate what those pay awards are. And, you know, at the same time, if we were on a picket line on one day and then in government the next, trying to negotiate with the people on the picket lines, you'd be saying, well, hang on a minute, you know, well, before you were on the picket line, now you're the people negotiating. So that's the reason we took this decision. I understand why it's controversial, but that's the reason that uh, Keir Starmer uh, took, took, this, um, uh, took the decision he did. But you should be in no doubt about our commitment to fair pay. And also, I just made this one other point, which is, you know, what we've seen is not only a vicious legislative attack on working people and the rights of working people, and not only kind of, you know, continuing austerity for many people, but this comes after 13 years of absolute savage attacks on people's pay. And so that's our perspective. Right, very good. We're going to go to it. Promised you a question, and then I think there are those in the rest of the world. And I'm, I'm not going to get to everybody, but you can come back at the, down here at the end, talk to them one to one at the end if necessary. So, here first, and then we'll take you've got two online. Yep. I'll keep it short. Yes. Uh, I'm Luban Rusev. I'm a law student here, and I basically wanted to ask. Is it the way, it, because I didn't hear a lot about Europe, and that question always comes back, but I wanted to ask, isn't the way to pay for all these changes that are necessary to move us into the green transition and do these ambitious green new deals, isn't what is necessary the economic growth of re-entering the European Union, which is almost an inevitability? So I wanted to ask you guys, about what sort of commitments there are to re-entering Europe and ensuring that that funds the change. This is a view that often does not speak its name. So, it, well, I mean, obviously here it does a bit, but anyway, Richard, Peter, uh, tell us what you've got online. Yeah, so online, the first question, um, with the working classes facing high energy prices, low wages, and little hope for the future, how can Labour convince them that the climate crisis is a priority? And uh, the second question, um, it was great to see a connection made between climate breakdown and inequality and justice, um, but um, I noted no mention of GDP. So um, how do we, uh, do we have to change the way we measure success in the economy and therefore society? Okay, again, three personal. Um, I think the GDP question sounds very much yours, Mayasa. Should we go to you first for that one? Yeah, great question and a very simple question for me. Uh, we, we absolutely need to expand our metrics of success. And for me, for a very simple reason, for a long time, GDP broadly tracked um, improvements in living standards. So actually it was, it was a good proxy for people to use. And what we've seen in the last 15 years is that there's been a huge divergence. So even at points where the economy has not been doing very well anyway, but even at points where it was doing okay, um, we didn't see improvements in living standards. Um, and so for me, it's kind of any of this has been Neff's position for 30 years long before me. It is a bizarre thing to hold as the kind of holy grail when it doesn't track the reality of people's lives. Um, and so I do think there needs to be a wider uh, metric. We often talk about well-being, um, And even if well-being is too far to go, I think GDP, along other things that actually matter to people, 
right? It is about your living standards. It is about your health. It is about other things. That's what people feel success in their lives. And it's bizarre that, you know, you can be a government that maybe achieves growth, but you hammer everything else and you're supposed to be a success. That seems incredibly bizarre. And Ed, Liam, the question about, I mean, it's, you know, it's easy to say, you know, people should care or you can find a way of squaring the circle. People worried about the cost of living, biggest fall in living standards during this government's life of any since records began in 1955. And climate, though very important as a freestanding issue, convincing people paying bills week by week, day by day, hour by hour, that somehow this is something they should sort of focus on. I know you're going to say it's possible to do both, but you can see why the questioner asked the question. I totally can see why the question asks the question, but just sort of, you know, we mustn't be, we mustn't be stuck in a mindset. I'm not saying this about the question, maybe I'm saying about you. Yeah, uh, blame uh, on uh, me, not uh, uh, Sort of a decade ago, it yeah. is cheaper to save the planet than to destroy it. No, I guess- it's that, No, no I but guess. it's really important this point because, because renewables are nine times cheaper than gas. So when we are saying, let's sprint towards zero carbon electricity by 2030, that is lower bills, mm. as well as greater energy security, not being at the mercy of petrostates and all of that, um, as well as tackling the climate crisis. I mean, that is the answer. Okay. I, I, I mean, I submit. It doesn't okay. mean to say there aren't. It doesn't mean to say there aren't. It doesn't mean to say there aren't. You know, some costs and investments you need to make because this is all about. You know, this just goes back to a question you asked earlier. You know. We're in this massive transition, and yes, it does require intervention because otherwise the benefits and burdens of this transition will not be fairly shared. Um, but it, but it absolutely, is, you know, this is the way to get down bills. And I think people have a sense of that. You don't get out of a fossil fuel crisis by saying, let's have more fossil fuels. They, they absolutely do. And, you know, what, what's been extraordinary about the last year is that this is now an argument that you can win on a doorstep in under 90 seconds. Because you ask people what's happened to their energy bill over the last year, they will base, they will tend to say it's either doubled or tripled. Um, so people absolutely get the idea behind retrofitting and you know local solar or wind. People absolutely get what Ed has said about renewables being cheaper. Um, retrofitting is a key part of it, by the way. But you know the second piece of the puzzle is that people now get the argument about jobs in a way that they didn't. And my, I started my working career in a white van. Um, I, I grew up in Essex, I've just about lost the white socks, but you know, my first job was driving white vans. And if you look around the streets of the West Midlands or Northfield, for example, you know, one in 10 workers work out of a white van. Many of those people will be electricians, they will be plumbers, they'll be carpenters. And actually the retrofitting revolution, the transition of our housing stock is the biggest job creation exercise for white man, man and woman that we have had in this country since the Second World War. And they have had a hell of a time over the last kind of couple of years. They were completely shortchanged on the COVID support for the self-employed. And actually they can see the opportunity ahead of them. So, you know, sometimes we've just got to kind of bring it down to the level of the street and say, look, those people, those people, those people, those people working out of a white van or your energy bills coming down, People get it now in a way that they just, I didn't think they did in the, a couple of years ago. Europe? Did we do Europe? On, on Europe? Hmm. Well, I mean, I mean the know, truth is... The issue that they're not, I mean, it, it is a slight sense, I think it's not unfair to say that the Labour Party perhaps underdevelops its future position. No, no, and I, and I can, I, and I can, well, I I mean, can say this as a humble backbencher uh, without front bench discipline. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, the truth is that we have got to draw closer to Europe again in reality over the course of the next parliament there is no way on earth the european union would let us back in even if we wanted to go um because actually, actually having come out they see a very different sort of arrangement in the future so a closer relationship yes but that is not going to be the source of riches that we need for, to pay for some of the things that ed and miata have talked about and that's why andy's work and aaron's work is so important wealth in this country has tripled in the last yeah. 25 years yeah, so 14 and a half trillion pounds the wealth of the people on the sunday times rich list you've got, to, you've got to be in the top thousand to get on the sunday times rich list that's increased by fivefold in the last 20 years we have just poured into the monetary system 850 billion pounds worth of quantitative easing 
lowering interest rates, increasing the wealth of anybody who owns an asset. In that world, I don't think it's unreasonable to say to those people lucky enough to have over 10 million quid, do you know what? You, we, we might just need a little bit more tax from you. The scandal of the Tory party chairman was okay. He didn't pay his taxes and he didn't declare it. And if we had more tax inspectors, we could have fined him a lot earlier. But is it time we started asking the question of why, why was he only paying 20% tax on, on a 25 million pound bonus when actually the top rate of tax is an awful lot higher than that in this country? So equalizing capital gains tax, paying national insurance on um, investment income, you know, ideas like a wealth tax on people with a net wealth of over 10 million, that's 40 billion pounds on the table. That is a very significant down payment on creating a greater measure of equality of wealth, but crucially raising the resources for some of the changes that we have to make as a country. Now, I know there are loads more questions. So what I'm going to do, is, I can't take any more because there are so many and we'll be here all night, which will be good. What I am going to do is encourage you if you want to come and talk individually to the panel or indeed to Clive, who is at the front here. Now is your opportunity. This is real politics in real time for those of you who want to do it. But I just need to wind up the evening with a few thanks, apart from the excellent panel who very clearly and directly put their, play, their case and answered the questions. I want to thank um, those doing British Sign Language here on the screen. Thank you very much for them. IT folk who's been making everything work as well. Thank you. Plug to the LSE's International Inequalities Institute, whose hashtag and uh, email details you can see here. Look them up on the website, follow their activities. But other than that, thank you all very much for coming and at home. <laughs> Look out for lots of other LSE events and come to them too. Good night. Or come up if you want to.